I've been using the RP diet to fuel my weightlifting performance for years, and RP's simple, science-based approach has been instrumental to my success. With the new RP Diet app, following RP's principles is as easy as entering my goals and schedule and choosing my favorite foods. The app builds a diet to my exact needs, reminds me to eat my meals, and adapts to my body's changes every single day and week. The RP Diet app is a huge help in my quest to become the best athlete I can be, and if your goal is to be your best, it will help you. Three, two, one, da 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 bump. We're back. Is the Mario song? Yeah. <laughs> All right, folks, uh, thanks for joining us this week. Uh, I apologize that we kind of got off schedule again. Unfortunately, I'm dealing with some, uh, some family stuff that's not super pleasant, and uh, Mike was able to help me out here. So appreciate your guys' patience, and uh, we'll get your questions answered this week like we always do. So thanks for being with us. In an erratic and untimely manner. <laughs> All right, so here's the deal. We are going to go to the RP plus questions first, as always. And then we are going to go to a few YouTube questions as well, right? Which is much better than Instagram questions. Yeah. Great. Googly um, moogly. By not people who don't exist. All right. So. Shall we start? Let's do it. Okay. Um, Aiden Brown. <laughs> no relation to James Brown. Maybe. Ow! <laughs> There's a, an amazing YouTube video that's uh, titled James Brown High on Drugs. <laughs> <laughs> you can see where that's going. And it's fucking gold because <laughs> it's uh, it's just like him being interviewed on a regular news show and it's uh oh, sorry hold on god damn it i full screen the shit again oh escape okay uh him being interviewed by a regular news reporter and she's like so uh mr brown you know uh, what has been sort of your musical productivity of late and he's like uh Da, 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 da. And she's like, <laughs> okay. And so there's some allegations of some substance abuse. They're like, I feel good. Uh, she's it's like, just clips of him like saying weird shit. No, it's like he might as well have just been doing clips of the songs. It was unbelievable. That's unbelievable. amazing. That's amazing. Um, all right. Aiden Brown says, hi, Mike and James. Looking at the mini cut manual, one of the example Paradise Plans outlines to have three mesocycle mass of four to eight weeks. To have a three mesocycle mass of 48 weeks each. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Mini cup for four weeks, head back into an eight week mass, two week maintenance before heading back into another four week mini cup. Then finally, a four week mass and maintenance period to finish off the macrocycle plan. Oh, this is just an example plan. How can someone take this and make it optimal for them versus generally how many cuts should be incorporated for long term massing goals when fat accumulation is too high and resensitization is needed? Is that only that a mini cut should be carried out? Yes. So the purpose of a mini cut is to address actual things. It doesn't have any magical benefits to sort of preemptively ward off anything. So when your body fat has gotten to a level in which the next massing phase would get it to too high of a level for your preferences and or optimality, it is then that you would employ a mini cut to pave the way for your next mass phase, so to speak. And if you're still lean, there's no reason to do a mini cut, James. Yeah, I don't really see much more after that. The you can you can set that up in a number of different ways. That's the example one in the book, but like you could certainly shorten it up on either the weight gain side or the maintenance phases that you take. Um, but really, there's nothing magical about it. It's really just to set you up for productive mass phase and body fat issues aside. You can kind of spin it however you want. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Daniel Hacker is up next. He says. Do you think having a long-term body weight range plus or minus five pounds and body fat range for physique is a good idea if you don't aspire to compete? Um, long-term body weight rate range and body so I think, fat range. I think he's basically saying like, if you, even if you're not a competitor, should you kind of have some upper and lower bounds in terms of body weight and body fat that you set for yourself so you don't get like too big or? Yeah. I can't tell if he means like a stable condition or goals. 
Yeah, I think I think what he means is for like his mass phases. So like maybe like not going above a certain weight that would put you at a certain body fat or, you know, basically like kind of keeping a tidy upper and lower as he goes throughout his body count yeah. phases. That's how I interpret that at least. And sure. I think that's, that's a fine interpretation. Pretty um, reasonable idea, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it's absolutely reasonable. There's another way to ask the question, James, is Daniel, is, um, you know, do you want to look like X, Y, and Z? And do you want to look pretty close to X, Y, and Z when you're not pushing the pedal to the metal and or just really focused on your diet to always look like that? And then how far off of that are you willing to look at your worst, so to speak? When you sort of say yes to all of those and then you put a, a range on that ladder, then you sort of answer the question, right? So, so for example, you might look your best at 175 pounds, like crispy, crispy, fried chicken look. And if you, you know, it takes like, you know, you're being on your P's and Q's to do that. Like your diet's on point, all this other stuff, you train really regularly, and kind of, you know, pretty decent volume, so on and so forth. Um, so that's cool. If that's the case, great. Um, you do that. And then you sort of like go to Thailand for a month, or like super mega vacation. And, you know, or, you know, whatever, holidays or some shit you're not going to want to be super crispy through that because it's going to be like shitty to diet through some really fun stuff. So you sort of like say, okay, like 175, look amazing. If I'm up to like 180 or even 183 or whatever at the end of this, I don't care. And that really allows you to relax, still train a little bit, eat fundamentally okay, and then make some room for some, some fun stuff and some carefree living. And then when you come back uh, after a month or whatever, you can sort of maintain 183, whatever, maybe get strong for a while and then do another sort of like four to six week fat loss phase really. And then get back down to 175 super crispy and then sort of walk around and flash your bare abs at people. Yeah. And I think that's a good way of setting up kind of your life priorities where you, you know that you don't have to get leaner than a certain amount because the, the pain and the cost to benefit of time spent doing dieting and suffering is just too shitty. And mm -hmm. if you find that like, you know, you get a little too pudgy, you start to feel self-conscious and not great about your, your body comp and your fitness. Those are all perfectly reasonable boundaries you can set for yourself. And that's very similar to kind of what I do, except I don't really go up and down anymore. I mostly just kind of do what I want. And then the other half of the year when I said, oh, that's above my comfort zone, I go back down to my comfort zone and then I cruise for a while. So same idea, basically. Yeah. All right. And he follows up with asking, Tied to the broad question above, can you shit test my long-term mindset slash goal for my physique training? I have set a body weight range goal at a certain body fat with multi set by rep performances in many of my lifts. My train of thought, this might be really dumb, but I'm sure James will tell me. <laughs> oh, because yeah, I'm the asshole, right? I'm the bad cop. You were on an asshole streak last time, man. Holy shit. Man. Um, is that my train of thought is that I will push my body Weight up over time, always at a reasonable pace, taking maintenance phase, many cuts, and uh, easier long cuts until I can make these numbers. Once I can, then I will maintain at a higher body weight and then do a real cut diet to get down to 8 to 10% fat while still being able to hit these numbers. I'm not too far away from these lift goals. Most lifts are just 5 to 10% higher than what I can do currently. Mm. That's totally fine. The 5 to 10% uh, seems reasonable. What I will say is once the part here is I will then maintain at a higher body weight and then do a real cut diet to get down to eight to 10% fat while still being able to hit these numbers. You might not be able to hit these numbers at the time that you diet down, but it might be a couple weeks later when you recomp glycogen, drop fatigue. Sure. And if you really want to eventually get to being at eight to 10% and hitting those numbers, you might have to get considerably stronger than you when you initially hit them at a higher body fat. Yeah, I think other than those kind of like acute performance related things, which can kind of wax and wane with your body weight, um, I think that's a perfectly fine strategy. I don't really see any major problems with that. Some lifts, just keep in mind, like there are some lifts like bench is a good example where if you lose a whole bunch of body weight, your performance is very hard to maintain. That's just normal. Um, but other than that, I don't know, it looks pretty good to me. I don't know why he thought I would be so critical of that. Jeez, you guys think I'm a curmudgeon asshole. Mm-hmm. Damn it. All right. Basim. 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 Hey, boy. Hey, boy. Hey, Basim. Thank you, boy. Um, hey, Docs, Mike, and James. Thanks for answering my last week's questions. Love your new haircut, James. Looking good. Also, thank you, buddy. Thanks, guys. I pay money to come on a site <laughs> getting to get called an incel. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like a good deal to me, Basim. 
you know you love us and we love you back. Taking one of your common Instagram comments, comment trolls for a ride was quite fun. Oh yeah, Bassam engaged analog to crunch. The great analog to crunch. Um, James, uh, this, this guy's been trolling me for a while. And sometimes he doesn't seem like he's trolling, like he agrees with stuff. And then sometimes he just goes on like an incel warpath. Um, what does he want? What do you want, analog to He wants to, to tell people that I'm using drugs and I don't know how to lift and that I'm a bad person. I oh, he's like, a, he's like a, a natty SJW? Yeah, but like he wasn't at first. It's, 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 quite, it's quite strange. And so he, okay, so he goes, taking one of your common Instagram uh, comment trolls for a ride was quite fun. I learned that they're simply too, just too stupid to realize that nobody actually disagrees with them while they're digging themselves a hole of continuous subject switching. Yeah, this guy's bad. He like, you're like, man, I, I don't like that this, this guy preaches like cheat reps and getting so strong that you lose your mind muscle connection. And Bassam was like, I don't think Mike's ever said any of that actually. And it's just, no one's arguing against you. And he's like, nah, these guys are full of shit. And Bassam's like, okay. <laughs> like, what? That's like the complete opposite of No, what? totally. It's crazy. It's totally and, crazy. And, and, I don't want to like stroke my own ego here, but I feel like, like that particular example, that's like, we're the only, we're one of very few people who actually talk about those particular issues. So it's like, yes. it's funny that he would paint them in like the complete opposite light. Yeah, you know what I mean? Fair. It's like, yeah. who else is talking about that? And how could you get it so c- confused? Yeah, what? It's, it's, it's really intense. He goes, I'm generally curious if they're being intentional or if they were dropped on their head as a child, probably both. Probably well, Bassam, I think you're ignoring the fact uh, respectfully that there's a normally distributed uh, curve about intelligence in the population that some people fall that high. Uh, <laughs> but on a serious note, I don't know. I think I don't think there's an intentionality there because intentionality would imply a point. Um, and and if you were intentional and pointed enough to really pick fun at someone, you might be better at it. Like you might actually pursue a certain line of argument rather than anything you can grab onto. And then, like you said, switch arguments midway through. It's just sad. It's like a like a thirteen year old would do. You know? So, I mean, just as there is an intelligence bell curve, there is a dildo bell curve. And this guy sounds like he's just on the the far side of that. He's just inceled, like, to the max. Yeah. Um, And then he says, on the training side, I'm currently enjoying my dealer week so far. First day in, and I'm already longing for hitting the iron harder uh, than the realization that we as humans are utterly small and insignificant. This, of course, is a good thing, as it means I'm far from being burned out. So, yay, yeah. True. Yeah, that's good. I got some new questions for this week. Nothing too complicated. I hope so. Question number one: I learned recently that mel- melatonin can act as a COX two inhibitor, like NSAIDs. Does chronic use of melatonin have a, a potential to affect my muscle growth response from training? Or is the tiny dosing melatonin point five milligrams to two milligrams too insignificant to actually have an effect on it? Uh, my understanding is that um, it doesn't have any tangible effects, at least in our current understanding. A uh, couple other things that are worth noting there. Uh, Melatonin is not, in my humble opinion, maybe not something that you should be taking chronically anyway, chronically in the sense of like habitual use continuously over time. It's okay to use it um, when you feel like it could be beneficial to you. But, and I, I harp on Mel, Mel does that all the time where she'll just take melatonin like all the time. I'm like, you know, it's probably not good to do that. I don't think it's, maybe I should rephrase. I don't think it's bad, but it, I think it might not be serving its purpose if you're constantly using it all the time. So um, it's not meant to be used that way, in my opinion. Uh, Number two, I don't think if there is an effect there that it's very significant, if at all. And number three, I would also argue that even if there is an effect, uh, you probably get a massive net positive effect from the melatonin if it allows you to sleep in high quantities and qualities. So whatever interference effect it may have, is probably massively outweighed by the positive effects you get from sleeping well. That would be my guess. Yeah. Next question related. Uh, how about antihistamines? Do they have an effect on performance and recovery? The spring fucks me up and stuffs all of my orifices. So my quality of life suffers without use of them. So I'll just sort of parley what James said. There's no direct research that I'm aware of on muscle growth and um, antihistamines, although I suspect there's no relationship. I've used antihistamines for a considerable amount of time. As a matter of fact, actually, when I was living with James for several years, uh, James has a cat and I'm allergic to cats. So I use antihistamines for two or three years straight. And I did not really notice a reduction in adaptation that was uh, sort of palpable um, for sure. But you know, who knows, uh, NF1 doesn't mean shit. Uh, I don't know of any studies on that literature, but I will say that if you take the, all the cortisol dumping you'll have from being fucking miserable and um, 
not just the quality of breath reduction, but the sleep interference that high allergy levels can oh, have. Yeah. It's absolutely almost certainly worth it to take antihistamines. Um, they put me on my ass. Like I sleep like a child. And that alone probably boosts my recovery because there's no way I'm not getting some decent sleep on antihistamines. Yeah, and some some antihistamines, like if you get the uh, like the pseudoephedrine, the behind the counter kind, actually have like an amphetamine effect. Can actually it, it feasib- feasibly boost your performance in some cases, which is yeah. maybe not what you're going for. Um, the only thing I think where is, that's worth talking about and having a significant performance decrement are antibiotics, um, antihistamines outside of maybe just some lethargy. Uh, I don't think there's anything there. Antibiotics is one that people will definitely notice, uh, if, especially like if they have a competition coming up, it's generally best practice to avoid the antibiotics before competition when possible. And you see MMA fighters all the time, they'll get like MRSA or something like that. And then they got to take antibiotics. And then they say in the post fight, like, oh, I had to take antibiotics. I felt like shit and tired all the time. But that's really the only one I can think of. Mm-hmm. Uh, he goes, thanks in advance. And of course, I can't leave without continuing this nuclear Russian Jew versus Russian Arab debate slash alpha contest. I love it. Mike, you, you do have a good point when you said that my name in Russian is wrong and should sound like Maxim or Vadim. That's the, James, that's where you get Maxim from. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Uh, I never actually thought about this as I've just been called that my entire life. I'm actually going to ask my mom why it's Basim and not Basim in Russian. Uh, I think she told me uh, a long time ago that she w- would call me uh, Basa, like Basa, and the Eam just kind of appeared. <laughs> That's pretty <strange. laughs> So I concluded that my name in Russian does not follow the uh, rule of names, probably because of its non-Russian origin, and therefore it can be an exception. Yep, absolutely. Fair Please. enough. Also, how does one pronounce Israel in Russian? I can't seem to actually figure it out. Uh, it's Israitid. Mikhail Alexandrovich Israitid. Um, That's like still pretty phonetic i mean i don't speak russian but that's how like it's actually more phonetic than the english pronunciation yeah, yeah. Ra, e, tel, uh because in english it it should be israel should that middle e should just be gone no <laughs> is goddamn good reason yeah. for that thing i think it just uh, to relate you more to the nation of israel um there you go all right and, and he guess says anyway hope you two have a fantastic evening and nothing suspiciously bad happens to you in the next three days well it is a devil's night tonight yeah, that's right. Uh, actually, James, because of your hairdo, you're good. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yes, I use the uh, the same uh, cat buzzer that I use for Piccolo. I use on my head. That's how I cover. <laughs> that's excellent. I hope you get some kind of weird cat disease that I can't help you with. Dick, you wish me ill that badly? <laughs> God. Well, you don't know, worry. Any ill I can wish you. Oh, sorry. You know, what were you saying? There, well, I was going to say uh, Brazilians actually uh, have a common disease that's caused from cats. Uh, what's it called? Uh, fuck! It's gonna. This is gonna bother me. It's uh, it's something you can get from cats from from when they uh, from from their interacting in their litter box, and it can cause like hypersexuality amongst other things. As a whoa, so, what? And it's a very common common thing in uh, Brazil. God, what's it called? This is gonna bother me the rest of the night until I figure this out. Um, I'm gonna Google it right now because I know toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis, yes. Babies can get it and stuff. Mm-hmm. Hypersexuality sounds great. Um, sounds very Brazilian. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Sean Murakawa Rubin says, hey, guys, number one, we know that delitting with easy workouts is better for fatigue dissipation than taking a week completely off. Does this also apply to joint and connective tissue recovery? Oh, especially applies to joint connective tissue recovery because – Getting blood flow to the muscles is not terribly difficult, but getting blood flow and pliability to the joints and connective tissues is much harder. And thus physical activity and a warming of the area actually helps much more. It's almost the entire basis of rehabilitation, not the entire, a big basis of rehabilitation. For sure. Is to get the areas mobile. Uh, there sorry, is, look, go ahead, James. Yeah, uh, there is something to be said with the, um, the connective tissue stuff where some time off can be warranted where uh, just doing light sessions might actually be contraindicated. And that's when you have like severe um, inflammation, like if you have like tendonitis in your elbows. So he actually gets to that. He goes, my elbows and the surrounding areas are nagging me quite a bit. And to my layman intuition, it would seem like a complete break would do better uh, for healing them than light training. So uh, here's the thing, Sean, I think that if they nag you so much that a deload workout won't make them better, 
then you need to do two things. One is for sure take a week off. And secondly, take maybe two or three weeks off of the movements that hurt them, possibly even the body parts that hurt them or the muscle groups, and reconsider your program design and exercise selection and execution so that you don't run into this problem. In other words, I, I would not like for you to end up in a situation where for your lower body and other parts of your body, uh, every six weeks when you deal it or whatever, you do light training, but for elbow involving movements, you always every six weeks, every time you deload, you do no training. Like that does not indicate an underlying condition that's that's really good. You're like, it's like if you have this just disgusting infection on your knee and, and you just always shower by wrapping it up in a cellophane and people are like, dude, shouldn't you get that looked at? And like, no, it's okay. I just wrap it up and then I can shower the rest of my body. I'm like, yeah, but I think the local issue is probably a problem that needs its own attention. One of our friends uh, more or less did that, Alex, when he's like cut his hand and just left it in a glove for oh, God, I hate this. <laughs> um, a couple other things too. So this is one of the reasons why Mike and I are really big on finding pain-free workarounds when you're having issues, right? So uh, we usually say if something's causing you pain or if even if it's not, even if you're not like, ah, it's not pain, but it's like inflamed, I can tell it's inflamed, right? Or something like that. We usually say, try and find something else that doesn't, doesn't cause that same pain or irritation. One of the big benefits being uh, most obvious is that you can continue training, right? So you can either, uh, either get stronger or keep getting more muscular and hopefully in a way that's not exacerbating the injury. One of the other benefits of doing the pain-free workaround is that in that sense, you are kind of still getting some active recovery to that area. You're still um, activating the muscle. You're still warming the area. You're still getting more flow. And it might not be in a way that's causing the inflammation, right? So in a sense, uh, the pain-free workaround can act as a I don't want to call it an active recovery, but kind of get that same effect while still being able to train and not exacerbate that area. So another big win for the pain-free workaround. Mike, wasn't somebody on you recently about this? Didn't we talk about this? Somebody was like, mm. I thought we... Michael Ray, I believe is his name, of Barbell Medicine, uh, hit me up on Facebook in a comment section on one of my posts where I referenced our upcoming book and saying that if you have movements, a movement that you're doing that causes you pain in a specific area more than a few times in a row, that you can trade it out for another movement that is of similar muscle targeting that doesn't hurt. So for example, if pull downs of a certain grip seem to cause your elbow pain, switch to pull downs of another grip or switch to assisted pull-ups. And whatever doesn't hurt. And now that it doesn't hurt, you can continue to progress in that exercise for a long time and then eventually come back to that other exercise with lightweight, reassess your technique and try to ease into it in such a way that it doesn't hurt. And uh, he got on me big time about, uh, so he made a number of claims. I'm not up to date on the literature, essentially uninformed on literature about the psychosocial theory of pain. Uh, That's right. And, yeah, I remember. Yeah, this. all this other stuff. Um, I considered yeah. the interaction uh, interesting. I would say that um, there is... Uh, a concept there where we, I ended up asking him, what is the protocol for detection of pain sequentially several workouts in a row in an area? And he, and he said that, uh, you know, you should modulate load, which is to say reduce it and modulate range of motion, which is to say also reduce it so that the pain mitigation occurs. The thing is, is that our argument is interesting on its face, but doesn't um, unfortunately um, go very far because both load modulation to a, large extent or to some extent and ROM, uh, range of motion modulation to a very large extent um, create problems for overload. They actually make the exercise worse for hypertrophy. Um, whereas a total switching of the exercise to one that is uh, good loading and good range of motion, but is different and thus doesn't hurt you actually checks all the boxes in, in hypertrophy training. These specific exercises are almost completely irrelevant. Um, and it's, can you do full range of motion and can you load? <laughs> and then can you stick to it? There's really those three questions that will result in hypertrophy. So um, it, it seemed like there was a, a bit of a, uh, you know, I think this probably a very sharp guy and was meaning very well. Um, I didn't get to the point in the logic where the circularity of it broke a little bit. So I, it seemed to me that, okay, you know, and there's also a question of um, sort of risk reward that I think you were, uh, you brought up as well, James, and another one of our conversations, like, the, the chances that there's actually nothing wrong with you and the pain is entirely psychosomatic, so to speak, or psychosocial. And this, is, this is good. It's fine chance. It's extant. You know, like, it's, let's say it's 50%. Fine. Uh, let's say it's 90%. Because what's the downside of switching an exercise and, uh, entirely? Not much downside, but maybe some uh, sort of uh, stigmatization of pain and uh, 
people hopping from movement to movement to movement and, and sort of running sure. away from phantom pain, which is, becomes incrementally less likely the more severity of that option you advance. Um, to, or to say more simply, like a severe version of that is highly unlikely anyway, right? But, uh, but then the alternative is you actually do have some kind of structural deformation or damage and you getting away from that exercise actually saves that area and makes it continue to be not injured. And that's a really big plus side and the downside just seems to be much smaller. So I think James and I would err on, look, if something hurts you once in training, like we really just don't give a shit unless it's a incredibly sharp pain. I think you should go back next time and try to work on your technique a little bit, warm up nice and light and work at it again. But if two or three or four sessions in a row just consistently hurts you and you've done your very best, it's time to abandon that movement for the time being and then uh, go to another movement where you can do full ROM and load and then reassess later. So I thought yeah. that was... Totally agree. And then Sean, just to be very explicit in, in what we're talking about here. So what we're saying is if you have, like if your elbows are consistently bugging you to the point where, you know, you would consider it like tendonitis. Um, what we're saying is that doing uh, like pull downs or skull crushes, whatever it is, that's kind of irritating it, doing a light session uh, or some like active recovery style workouts is probably not going to be enough to alleviate that. And so it's going to have to be a combination of finding a pain-free workaround, possibly reducing the amount of you know volume to that area or stimulus to that area but um you know what you can get away with for your muscles like you can do a couple light sessions usually you can bounce back you can do a deload usually you can bounce back your joints sometimes just take a long time and just doing a couple light sessions might not be enough to get you back on track and that's why we kind of push people towards the workaround so you can because there's a time series problem where what you don't want to do is have to stop altogether to make your elbows or whatever stop hurting. So you want to keep making progress and probably the better way to do that is to find something you can do pain-free. Mm -hmm. All right. He says, number two, you guys have mentioned how, for example, 200 by eight at RPE seven is roughly equivalent to performance to 205 by seven at RPE eight and so on. This has always confused me if they're equivalent, then why do we say we progress from one to the next, uh, from one to the next micro to micro? So that's actually a very easy answer. Um, RPE seven is more stimulative than RPE eight. Uh, it is maybe equivalently impressive, but it's more difficult to pull off. So uh, because it, it, your RPE just sort of determines the magnitude of stimulus that you're imposing anyway from RPE 5, so to speak, to RPE, RPE 10, right? During the course of a mesocycle, you move from higher RPR, sorry, lower RPEs. We're usually used to saying RIR, right? Um, yeah, I was going to say, RPEs, I think we maybe got that one backwards. RIR. Yeah. But, you know, just an RPE language, just to keep it consistent here, you go from RPE sort of 6 to 7, 8, 9, 10, and then deload, right? So, you know, if... Uh, you had 200 for eight uh, at RP seven, and then you moved in 205 and got seven reps uh, at RP eight. If they're roughly equivalent, okay, sweet. But remember, they're roughly equivalent, but you probably accumulated some fatigue between one and then the other. So thus, actually, while your performance is the same, your underlying fitness has increased, right? You're basically saying like, I'm one week deeper into my program. I'm one week more cumulatively fatigued, assuming you're training above MED, fatigue accumulates. Uh, but I can still perform the same, right? So if you actually continue to perform the same, but your uh, RPEs are declining, right, or perform the same as far as relative metrics, the RPEs are declining and fatigue is accumulating, that actually means your underlying fitness is improving, right? So why do we progress from one to the next and micro to micro is to chase the RPE target because uh, RPEs falling through the mass cycle make a, a sense in a variety of ways that we have described in, in many, many. Answer. So we can always review them if you want to ask for next week's follow-up of like how, why do falling RPEs uh, like something we want out of a hypertrophy cycle uh, for chasing optimality. Then, um, yeah. yeah. And then Sean, just also keep in mind, right. Um, you're right. Sometimes it is kind of, splitting hairs here and it can be difficult, but it's very difficult to evaluate, you know, a, a, a long-term progression across a mesocycle, just looking at one set, you know, across a variety of things that you could be looking at. And so Mike already explained kind of the fitness fatigue paradigm aspect to that, where basically your performance kind of stays level. Um, but also you have to consider that you might not have to actually 
have a super like statistically significant tangible difference between some of these things week to week. The differences might be small. And some people like Eric Helms might even argue that you might not even need to actually have something that's that different from week to week, as long as kind of throughout the entirety of the mesocycle, it is getting harder in some way, right? It doesn't necessarily mean you have to do a little bit more weight or a little more reps or a little more sets every single time on every single one of those sets that you're assessing. So just keep that in mind. It doesn't mm-hmm. have to be on everything necessarily. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so another way to think about it is like, um, well, actually, hold on a sec. 200 by eight at RP7. So technically though, that example, I don't think they're equivalent. 200 by 8 at RP7 should be equivalent to 205 by 8 at RP8. Would you agree with that, James? I think so. I think, you know, I, I don't want to spend too much time, like, picking apart the example. I think he's, sure. uh, he's just kind of say like, similar weight, similar reps, similar RPEs, right? Yeah. Are they equivalent? Probably, you know. They're or, close to equivalent, but yeah. they're not exactly, and there should be some progression in difficulty. So the, uh, so, so your, the equivalent performance there. So 200 by eight at RP seven is roughly equivalent to performance of 200 by five, 205 by seven. It should be, the example is 205 by seven at RP seven. Yeah, that, would that would be the be equivalent example. More so equivalent. the RP eight actually should see you do 205 by eight, which is more technically, and there's that tiny little bit of overload that we call yeah, and so you could you could kind of think of it, Sean, like the the RPE in this case might be weighed a little more heavily than like the five pound difference in the the set that you did. You know, as the RPE goes up, we see more of an exponential kind of issue in terms of the amount of stimulus it gets, but also the amount of fatigue. And, and there'd be slightly different shapes. One would be more of like an asymptote. One would be more like an S. Um, but the RPE would be weighed a little bit more heavily. So when you see that change, it has a little bit more impact. You're serious about your goals, and the RP Diet app is here to help. It creates a diet for your specific needs, lets you choose your favorite foods, and tells you exactly how much of them to eat and when. Expert System AI guides you along to keep you on track to your goals. For less than $15 a month, you have one of the most powerful diet coaches in your pocket. Cutting edge data science tailored to your exact goals. The future is here today. Number three, sometimes I'll experience a very strange occurrence. Usually on machines, I'll be performing a set. My reps start to slow down and grind. And I swear I'm almost a failure, but sometimes I just flip a switch in my mind and I start exerting much more force and drive and I get like 10 more reps. Would this be a textbook example of me just going through the motions using my slower twitch fibers and my faster twitch fibers only after my conscious effort? Yes, it would be exactly that. Yeah. Um, and absolutely. There's, so there's a big, big influence on psychology and which is why studying uh, exercise science when you're actually getting in and trying to motivate people to go to failure you got to yell at them. There's multiple researchers will sit around and yell at you when you're doing curls or squats to get as many reps as you can every single time, because it's been shown through a variety of experiments that people self-assessed failure can often be as many as 10 reps away from where they did. So because Sean, you know that about yourself, you should aim to try a little bit harder than you maybe have been trying before, but start with low volumes because that can cause a lot of fatigue for you that you're not used to, but it'll probably give you much better results. And then not to be kind of like pedantic on the issue, but there's, there's asshole um, James. No, I'm no, no, I'm not trying to be an asshole. Um, There's a, there's a difference between kind of like assessing the RPE correctly and then like getting fucking amped up, you know, like getting self activated, like really hyping up for a set. So I think um, that those two things can be easy to conflate, right? Where you're like, Oh, like I, I flipped the switch. Well, like, did you flip the switch because you got like a huge adrenaline dump? Cause you were listening to your favorite music or cause you were thinking about something that got you really pumped up. Right. And now your performance goes through the roof. Well, that's because you got, you have, you, you know, you, you got pumped up for the set. So, there's probably like a good middle ground that you have to explore, which is not constantly like psyching up all the time for your sets, but not being too flat and cold when you're coming into a set so you can get an appropriate RPE or RIR assessment. Yeah. A training intensity. Yeah, exactly. Uh, sorry. And an, an intensity for training rather than for competition. Yeah. All right. Tony Drottnell says, Hey guys, this new public YouTube format is a real emotional roller coaster. I was excited as I am at the promise of more Marcos, <laughs> ah. I'm definitely missing the exclusive RP plus only secrets you guys no longer share. Like the perfect cue to hit your inner outer upper pecs during one arm cable flies, <laughs> or how 
work is progressing on the giant world destroying mechanical octopus. Tony, you know nothing of the octopus and you will cease and desist. Yeah, shut up. The octopus comes for you first. I've been wondering the following recently. I would like a sanity check from you guys. Would it be reasonable to surmise that both isolation movements and movements affecting smaller muscle groups require more frequent and radical variation to remain effective as compared to compound movements and movements involving bigger muscle groups? Very minor grip slash stance and rep changes seem to stave off stainless and big compounds for extremely long periods of time, but don't appear as powerful for increasingly isolated movements. What would, what would the major factor be? Simply the amount of muscle mass full stop, or more so because there's a greater diversity of insertions, fiber types, fiber bundles at different angles, neural coordination, etc. I'm more skeptical towards the former. As more advanced individuals tend to benefit from greater variation as their muscle size increases, this may simply be a result of getting caught in the forest of confounders. Honestly, Tony, I have no fucking clue. I do suspect that as the complexity of the exercise and the muscles involved is higher, variation is presenting much more notable difference. Whereas like if you have wrist curls, it kind of doesn't fucking matter how you do them, but unless you do them very differently, it's just hitting the same shit over and over the same, same way. Um, that's a very good idea, but I, I would just be pure speculation on my, uh, my part, James. I'm not sure either. And I, I have basically the same kind of answer that Mike did. I think because isolation movements, you're just more limited in the kinematics aspects of it, where you, you can only do like a bicep curl in so many, like if you're doing it like in real pure isolation, like a preacher curl, there's only like so much variation you can do in that. And then after that, it's going to be more like uh, volume intensity modification. Same thing like machine, uh, even, even like a pec fly, right? There's only so many ways to do a pec fly that you can really tap into that variation potential where there's lots of different ways to do a bench press, something like that. So I think if you're looking at isolation moves, especially like machine isolation moves, there's just uh, at some point they just probably peter out and how much you get out of it. And then the MEV basically for that movement just gets so high for you to get anything out of it. It just becomes kind of a waste of time for you. So I'm not really sure why that is though. I would guess it's probably has to do with the, the planes of motion uh, and the kinematics that you're just moving in. It just gets stale after a while. Mm -hmm. okay this one uh, this is a mouthful fuck so <laughs> agne <laughs> agne maybe i suspect my agne. first guess is that you were lithuanian but agne only guess <laughs> That was my Forrest Gump voice. That's my own game. Hey, right, man, you got some of that acne on your face. Hey, man, you better <laughs> use some gyrus cascute on it. Ja, see you, kevi, see you, That was pretty ja, good. Ja, see you, kevi, see you, te. Shit. Uh, let me know how I did. I just pretend to be Icelandic when I pronounce shit like that. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, oh, boy, I can't wait for you guys to butcher my name. I have to spell it out constantly where I live. I don't, not that it matters, but I do believe this is a female. I just from the, I remember seeing the, the profile. Agne. It's like Agnes, maybe. I think it's like Agnes. Yeah, exactly. Let me plug this last name. Let's see if my guess was correct. Let me plug this last name into Google. See what kind of Lithuanian <laughs> shit pops up. Google's going to be like, what the uh, fuck? Let's see. Let's see. Okay, there's, there's a, wait. No way. There's like a YouTube channel with some kind of singer. Oh, it's the exact same name. Nope, it's just, it's just the person's we found Agnes favorites and liked videos. Peaches, the Hello Kitty, the Talking Cat, Low Carb Whoopie Pie. Ooh, that sounds okay. yummy. Excellent. Uh, God damn it! All right, let's. let's ooh, there's okay. There's LinkedIn. LinkedIn. You holy. <laughs> Quit being a creeper. Ew, no, this is public information. <laughs> I know. Oh, 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 I got it. About, I have moved from Lithuania to the oh, Netherlands. Oh, you called it. Boom. You called it. That was Unbelievable. amazing. Unbelievable. I can't and believe I you pulled that off. I probably the fuck out of her name because Lithuanians pronounce their shit like nobody does. I can't believe you pulled that off the top of your head like that. Unbelievable. Anyway. All right. I have a question about activity trackers and how accurate they are from your experience. I'm doing a female physique template two times a week. I started first time January 2019. and had great results with it being right after ACL reconstruction slash meniscus tear and doing squats at 50% of my 10 RMs. 17 pounds lost together with an RP fat loss on the app. Soup. Cool. Nice. nice. I finished all the mesos and went back to CrossFit five times a week and weightlifting once a week. I've overloaded my knee, which resulted in stopping any activity for basically a month till September. Oh, boy. Still having physical therapy. 
and was not allowed yet to squat below parallel and load up the bar to my usual weight. Prior to this, I bought Polar Ignite Watch to see how I'm recovering and sleeping. I tend to push myself and ignore signs or not even be aware of being highly fatigued, suffer in silence type of gal. Okay. Well, the strongest human of all times, also from Lithuania, Zhudunona Savitskas, um, also suffers in silence. Actually, I think he makes other people suffer by being the strongest thing that ever was. Because mm -hmm. everyone mm -hmm. wants him to press them over his head and he, he can't do it because of his training. He's yeah. like, I would love to press you up, but I just uh, can't. Yes, uh, sorry uh, for my training, but I cannot uh, have excess fatigue. Um, I love it when they used to interview him before he, like, every single one of the 10 or all classics he won. Kazmaier would be like, Big Z, how, how are you feeling, buddy? Are you, you feeling like a winner? Are you going to win the Arnold Classic? Uh, yes. Um, thank you, Kaz. I'm feeling good and uh, hopefully winning this year. But uh, <laughs> the competition is very strong and Brian Shaw looked very good. So we shall see. You know, like, Z, can we get you to hate anyone? We can no. get you to hate. Dude, he's like a city councilman in the town he lives in. He's crazy. Amazing. We're all mortals to him. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So she says to see if I am overtraining. So she got this watch. A week prior to the injury, it was alerting me that I'm overtraining. <laughs> <laughs> well. And have a high risk of injury. I thought, fuck it. It can't be right. I feel fine. Ugh. As a result, I why did you get reaction. the Why did you get the watch if you're not going <laughs> to listen to it? All right. As a result, I had a strong reaction of meniscus. Slash sharp pain during squat clean received in the bottom position. Wait, why are you doing squat cleans? I thought you couldn't squat. Yeah. What is happening? Yeah. My knee is calm now, and I uh, allowed it to do more and do body squats or low weight squats and maybe a bit lower than parallel. But every time I do a female physique template workout currently, week three, mouse cycle one, my tracker says I'm overreaching again. Um, week three, okay. I swim uh, once a week, and I do empty bar weightlifting two times a week. And it doesn't say that with these uh, activities. Well, that makes sense because it's a lot easier. FPT two times a week has full body workouts and I rate as honestly as I can, which in week three MM1 doesn't really feel like much. I feel like I'm cruising with four to six sets per exercise, but it says I'm overreaching again, heart rate zone one to three. So I'm not sure if this means I have too much stomach fatigue still. Or is it too much volume for me? I'm not sure. Um, uh, should I ignore it this time? Body wise, I feel a nice pump after the session I'm, and I'm ravenous, but that's about it most of the time, not even sweating, never sore. And so all those things together, I would say there's a very low chance that you're systemically overreached, although I don't know the degree of the other stresses in your life, like career, so on and so forth. Um, so I would say that it, it doesn't immediately appear to me that you're actually overreaching. Um, the reason that you're hurting your knee probably has much more to do with specific mechanics of the disallowed exercise than it does with any accumulated fatigue you were carrying. Yes, I suspect that's the case. James, anything? Um, so yeah, the, the, the trackable devices can be useful. I think they are least useful for people who are primarily doing physique and or barbell sports, which seems like you're kind of, I would put you in that group of people. I think if you're, if you're doing like team sports or sports that have like a, a really good cardiovascular component, or if you're like a hybrid kind of person, you're doing strength training and endurance training, something like that. I think it can be very useful. Um, but there's nothing there that you can't measure yourself and you can't get a good feel for yourself either either by measuring it or just intuitive feel. So for example, if you're not sure if you're systemically overreached, you're not. I think that's a pretty fair way of assessing that. That's one of those things where you more often than not know pretty much right away when that becomes an issue. Why? Because it starts permeating all of the other aspects of your life, not just training, but your ability to uh, go to work, do your job, your mood, your affect, your hunger, your sleep, your uh, all those things will start being affected by that. So I think they are useful. I think for somebody like yourself who's doing female physique template, doing some swimming, doing some barbell stuff, it's not going to be super useful for you. Um, I agree with Mike. I don't think that uh, that you're very systemically overreached. And I think that your knee injury, although it did coincide with when the machine was telling you not to train super hard, I think that was more of the exercise that you were doing. I would say don't do any more of those squat queens cleans homie until you can actually squat below parallel when your PT says that's okay. I think that's just a mistake. Don't do that. Lay off any of the weightlifting or CrossFit stuff. Do the best PT on your legs that you can and do as much of the upper body stuff as you on the female physique template as you can. So I think that the, the wearables are good. People just um, haven't quite figured out how to use them yet, which is usually the problem. We have that same problem in sports science with GPS. We pull all this data from GPS. It looks amazing and nobody knows what to do with it for the most part. Same problem. Mm. 
best of luck. Yeah. Just don't do anything that is contraindicated by your therapist. <laughs> um, yeah, that's me. that's that's the bigger issue, I think, with the knee stuff. Just don't 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 be too quick to try and get back to weightlifting. I think that's a big mistake. Just I had I made the same mistake. I have the authority to like bitch about this because I had an ACL tear from rugby and I was doing the same stuff, trying to squat, trying to get back into like clean and jerk and snatch. And what happened? I just kept delaying my recovery of my knee injury. And all that caused it was for me to uh, have one really big buff leg for a long time and one skinny leg for a long time, because I would just favor the one side over the other instead of actually just doing the PT that I was supposed to be doing and doing more unilateral work, ended up setting myself back. So don't do what I did. Don't do what I did. Famous James Hoffman advice. That's the story of my life. Don't do what I did. <sighs> Real. All right. On to YouTube, yes? No! Yeah. YouTube's not terrible, actually. It's way better than Instagram, apparently. All right. All right. Do you have it actually uh, pulled up on your screen? Can you? Yeah, I sure do. I'll just rant it hit right the, up. Hit the share button. Ooh, I've got some porn pulled up here. Oh, uh, it, it, well, yeah, no, no, don't hit share then. Whatever, if you hit share, it's going to show like whatever you got going on on the screen. Uh, <laughs> so don't, don't do that. Hold up, hold up, hold up. And we're good. We're good. Uh, hold up. Uh, share. And then it will, it'll kind of prompt screen. you the screen you want to share. Yeah. Does it work? Yep. There we go. Perfect. All right, so let's see which one we should pick here. Um, this is from last week's. So <laughs> I like, we got I'm looking at the suggested ones on the side. Why you should do intermittent fasting, Joe Rogan featuring GSP. <laughs> like how that just came up right away. This is apparently me. stuff I should be watching, including my own RP Diet 2.0 videos. I don't and, know if it knows. Cornelius. There yeah, go. some jujitsu, some Douglas Murray. The vegan somewhere. debate. Where's Douglas Murray? There he is. All right. So let us go to, uh, here's an interesting one, James, for you. How much uh, of an effect does one night of bad sleep have on gains? And to what extent can you make up for lost sleep later? And this is by Trifroze. Trifroze. Yeah, that actually is a really interesting question. I'm not sure. I don't know if it's something that you can actually quantify. I don't know if it's something that we can even, could even measure to any realistic degree, especially for like hypertrophy training. Cause it's like, how much hypertrophy do you actually get from one session to begin with? Who really knows? It's hard to say. Um, so I don't know, uh, to what extent can you make up for uh, lost sleep later? It's also very difficult to say now, uh, I think from a systemic point of view, like if you're looking at like systemic overreaching mark markers, I think it could probably do you pretty well. If you got, uh, if you banked some extra sleep, if you had like a, if you had, um, maybe one night of insufficient sleep, and then you got a little extra the next night. I think that probably works okay. On the local level, I'm not sure if that works at all. And what we actually see with sleep, which is really interesting, I don't know how well these two things are connected, so bear with me, but in the example of learning, we know that sleep plays a really, really big role in your ability to learn new things, whether it's knowledge or motor skills, a variety of things. And they've actually demonstrated that uh, if you are trying to learn a new task, maybe a motor skill, for example, and you miss sleep that night, it was mostly an all or nothing effect. If you miss the sleep, then you missed out on your learning opportunity. There could be similar things that happen with fitness where you might actually miss out on a substantial amount of opportunity if your recovery is impaired by sleep to that degree. I don't know. That's just me speculating. Uh, it's an interesting question. Not sure. What do you think, Mike? I just wouldn't worry so much about yeah. one day um, for sure. Um, can you make up for lost sleep later? I think James has already sort of outlined you really can't in any meaningful way. You can get a really good night's sleep the next day, but there's no getting it back. Um, yeah. uh, what I do is I try to reduce the degree of disruption. So for example, James and I travel all the time. James and I have a, a Friday in a new seminar country routine where we show up to the airport or to the, uh, we show up on an, on an airplane in the morning to another country, another time zone, really different time zone after shit or no sleep on the plane. And usually we show up at different times and we're flying for different areas and we sort of meet up at some point 
we haven't gotten down exactly the routine of fuck around until the Airbnb lets us in <laughs> because there's like that's the worst part. That sometimes honestly, they have three hours. That's of like, the worst. You guys just have to walk around London. <laughs> so and then what I do is usually I'll I'll train, uh, and uh, the training Trains is heavily again. modified, mostly machines and lots of caffeine. And then after training, get a nice meal. And then really the priority is get to the Airbnb, Airbnb, have some more caffeine to stay awake so that I don't fall asleep too early to try to re, re, recalibrate to the new time zone. And just really just relax. Like James and, and uh, Dr. Mel and uh, Dr. Gabby and I will watch like, like TV in a foreign country and laugh hilariously at accents and stuff. Like it is, the real bad idea is if you're staying up, it's just to further put stress on yourself. I think at that point you sort of enforce some stress, try to relax as much as possible. Yeah, That's totally. Nice. So I think the sleep you could, you know, we, we usually think of training in a chronic sense, right? Where you have to just do a lot of training consistently for a long time to reap any reward. The same thing mostly applies to sleep. You have to just have a good lifestyle to balance out the training. So Mike, like Mike said, don't think too much about like the effect of one, one night or one day or something like that. It's probably not a huge deal. Yeah. Yeah. I like somebody's, somebody, one of the comments, Sam Mc, McTavish, is James wearing an, uh, an all blacks training singlet? Fuck. Yeah, I was, but. Yeah. yeah, my heart so, hurts. They, so they got knocked said, out. Hold up. This guy goes, thanks for, guys for putting out this content on YouTube, Workout Unleashed. He said, I greatly appreciate it. Helps me get through my downtime between clients. Also, James, I know it's the All Black St. Dobbs. Probably worthless now that we got beat by England. At the I World know. Cup. It was so heartbreaking. We, we were able to watch while we were in, uh, in Ireland. <sighs> Tough love. Tough love. Tough love. I got, I got All Blacks uh, also, today. You can't really tell. but Look at this. Can you see my mouse or no? Yeah, yeah. Look at this review. Yeah, it's really Terminator bad. Dark Fate review. <laughs> yes, it really is that bad. I always kind of want to see the Terminators, and the reviews always come out before the movie, and I'm like, nope, guess not. Yeah. The last one oh. was okay. The last one was okay. Dun-dun, 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 dun-dun. I was too young when I saw Terminator 2, and that music scared the living Dude. shit out of me. Terminator 2 scared the shit out of me because I remember I came down, it was, uh, I, my dad was watching it and I came into the living room and it was the scene where the, the fucking Terminator had the blade arm like cutting through the oh. guy's face. Oh my God. And man. I was like, the, ah! the yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mil- I did not deal well with that shit. I was way too young. Um, the music for Terminator, I would actually probably listen to that in my car, just like the entire composition. I forget who made the Terminator. Hold up. Let me uh, look this up super quick. Terminator 2 soundtrack. It must be one of the famous people. Hans Zimmer, maybe? Um, uh, let's see. I didn't even fucking say who made it. Brad, Brad Feidel. Um, it's fucking brilliant. Be- oh, yeah, Brad Feidel. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I, I'm going to do a really shitty musical impression because I have dog shit for talent. Oop. <laughs> oh, 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 what were you watching? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I wasn't. It's was just a random video I clicked on. It happened to be the volume roundtable from like 10 years ago or some shit. It's a sassy, me frantically sassy clicking look. for today's episode. Uh, oh, 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 okay. Um, that the, the, the sound they do when like the T1000 is just like getting shot and nothing's happening. He's walking. It's like, ooh, oh, ooh, yeah, ooh. yeah. And you're just like, ooh. it's like, that Brad, whatever guy, he just picked the only sound effect that says unstoppable and like bad. <laughs> like there's no, it's just, man, again, too young. And I was like, fuck dude, fuck this. Everyone's dead. Terminator had the same problem that Aliens, the Alien franchise did, where the first two movies were like fucking fantastic and yeah, really unique. And then stopped. everyone after yeah. that was just kind of a rehash of the yeah. same shit. 100%. 100%. It's, a, it's a phenomenally uh, narrow concept when you think about it. Yeah, like, we think about aliens. You're like, all right, we got a ship. All right, now what else? We got space marines on it. Hit me. It's in space. Okay, and there's an alien. Oh shit! What else you got? What else you got? And like with Terminator, it's like the only way to make it kind of more unique is to have like a definitive closing to it, right? Otherwise, right, but play the time travel shit. Always time right? travel loops, man. Like, hey, you guys remember when you thought you ended the machine Holocaust? Like, yeah, well, you did. Yes, again. Go, 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 go. Right. (laughs) But it's almost like, okay, like that was scary in Terminator 2 and then maybe a little in 3, but at 4, 5, 6, it's like, come on, man. I don't take the shit seriously. Close the the series. Close it out. Another another guy's going to show up. That's... 
that's one of the things I really like about anime. Sorry, nerd tangent here, but a lot of like the really great series start and end. They don't just go on indefinitely. There's, you get the closure that you want. Same thing. Terminator, close it out. We're done. We want to see the ending. We want conflict resolution. Like Star Wars should have done. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yes. Yes. Finish it. Finish the story. The story's going at the, the Clone Wars was like yeah. the most egregious offense to that, where it's like, let's just take something that never ends and just keep filling this void of time with more <laughs> stories, more battles. <laughs> right? I will tell you this, man. I sure hope they have a big mop for this next movie because they got a lot of cleaning up to do. Holy fuck. They better, this next movie, this last one, better be the greatest goddamn movie ever because Dude. the last one was Dude. like, what empire was to being good it was to being bad like and the, and the end is disaster the ending was a disaster where you're like what come on good epic battle between to... snoke and fucking what's his name luke skywalker jk that never happened yeah but... and then he's like fucking dies or whatever it's weird you're like what what is this it was awful all right all right so uh, this is interesting i don't even i don't know if it's a question, but it is interesting to address. So, Arzel Purge says, you guys should definitely discuss supplementation and actual nutrition other than just micronutrients in and around training. I think he probably meant macronutrients, but we'll, we'll take that for what it is. I know a lot of people never consider the 90 nutrients, uh, the 60 minerals and the 16 vitamins and the 12 amino acids and the three essential fats that they need to take every single day, sometimes in a surplus in order to bypass the inroad of muscle damage. Uh, how to negate bad sleeping habits with nutrition, or what to take around sleep to help you relax and get more restful sleep, especially because a bodybuilding diet doesn't necessarily presuppose you take every single necessary nutrient. So uh, this is really more of, a, and I'm not, not so much answering a question, but rather sort of de- debating the, the asker. I suppose this isn't really a question, though, so it's good to debate. It's a really a suggestion. We do talk about uh, sleep uh, a lot and things to take for sleep. Uh, although the negating bad sleeping habits is or something we actually covered today, and it's not a thing that you can actually do. Do not negate bad sleeping habits. Also, like there's really no amount of nutrition that can overcome bad sleeping habits. And well, there's no want, amount of anything that can overcome bad sleeping habits. Yeah, and this sleep. is this is something, and not we're not trying to attack your your question here, but the, this is something that is actually covered in one of our books, and we 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 really hammer this home in the recovering from training book. We we talk about sleep. Uh, is a major priority and all the different ways you can you can do it and we also cite like which things are lower on the totem pole and and nutrition unfortunately is one of them in terms of recovery yeah and then it says uh i know a lot of people never consider the 90 nutrients 60 minerals so on and so forth Uh, since uh they need to take in a surplus in order to bypass the inroad of muscle damage so you don't bypass the inroad of muscle damage muscle damage occurs anyway it has never been demonstrated nor is there a hypothetical reason to think that a consumption of an excess amount of nutrients other than the macronutrients will have an effect of healing muscle damage faster. It's been shown that past their intakes of normal amounts, uh, vitamins and minerals specifically have no ergogenic effects in superphysiological doses. Protein has some of that effect. Calories certainly have a considerable amount of effect. Androgens have the biggest effect of the more you take, the better things get. But vitamins and minerals simply don't, and this has been um, studied very, very extensively, uh, specifically with mega dosing literature back in the 1980s, when bodybuilders did think in such an extreme way and thought, well, if I take 10 times the vitamins, I'll get 10 times better, and that certainly didn't work. Um, and uh, no I will, I will, yeah, I will say this, and this is something maybe we can have um, Gabriel, Dr. Gabriel Fondaro, our, our uh, expert in these matters, and, or Dr. Jen Case, come on here and do a little mini uh, interview on this webinar to talk about this. If you eat a relatively balanced diet, macronutrients are in order, you eat relatively healthy foods, and you take a multivitamin every day, your chances of a vitamin and or mineral imbalance that is in any statistically way detectably going to damage your training abilities and or results is incredibly small. Uh, It's just something you don't see. Um, I can't tell you how many uh, nutritionists that I've been around over the years, not sport nutritionists, that thought that the, uh, the improvement in every athletic performance is gonna result in you know, making sure to have this crazy, super diverse diet where you eat all the colors of the fucking rainbow and shit like that. And it's been studied pretty well and just doesn't make a fucking, to quote our mentor, Dr. Stone, hill of beans difference. Um, I like that expression. It just doesn't make a big difference because your body's profoundly good at getting nutrients out of food. It's not that difficult to do. Uh, this is in fact uh, pretty well demonstrated by the fact that people who eat the carnivore diet aren't actually dying, are, are performing in sport 
not so poorly. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, it turns out that, you know, if you eat a relatively balanced diet and you take a multivitamin, you, you're really just checking maybe 95% of the boxes. I mean, is there a 5% you could benefit from that you know, increase your performance by half a percent over the year? Maybe, maybe even. Unfortunately, studies aren't even powerful enough to detect such a change. So this, uh, there's, I, I, I wanted to address this point because there is this um, notion that if you take an incredibly deep dive into incredibly precise nutritional programming for someone, for example, uh, dieting where you check blood levels of nutrients every whatever number of days or weeks, and you reassert the diet to fix the imbalances, that that is going to be somehow way better result of performance. And it's kind of this idea that makes surface level sense. Tremendous waste of like, time. Right. It makes surface level sense because you're going to be a body's machine if we give it exactly the inputs it needs mm-hmm. based on what's sufficient and it's going to work better. But it turns out your body makes a really, really good balancing act in, in keeping most of its main processes working just fine. And, and the, the real sort of, sort of, maybe not last word, but the real big thing about nutrient deficiencies is until and unless they are clinically relevant and large, they really just are almost, they're almost irrelevant, right? So, uh, and That's deficiencies are only relevant in a clinical sense. Are yeah. you clinically deficient in X, Y, or Z? And that's really the only time it matters. Yeah. And then if that's the case, usually it's pretty obvious. Like if you're clinically deficient in iron, your work capacity is going to just shoot in the fucking ground. Mm-hmm. Right? It's not going to be like, oh, I could have had better workouts. Like your work is going to be dog shit. Right? So, but it, and again, in, in general bodybuilding diet, iron is usually over in, uh, there's an over intake. What do you think? We got, we got one more. So one we more. got a short one list more. of questions. Yeah, we got a pretty good one here. Hi, docs. This is from L. Hoff. James, you're sending yourself whoa, questions. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Who's in Hi, docs. I'm hey, dude, can you imagine if we got on here with fake accounts and fed ourselves questions? Like, Dr. Mike, being that you have one of the world's largest penises and brains, how do you, <laughs> how do you manage? Dr. James, I was wondering about mini cuts, troll myself. Fuck. You're like, fuck, I hate myself. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, docs. After a 50-pound weight loss and maintain for the last five to six months, oh, pretty impressive. Nice. I'm thinking of leaning down a bit next spring. I lift three times a week and do high-intensity interval training two to three times a week, as well as rolling in and outdoor and have built a decent amount of muscle mass on an isochoric diet. Debating if it would be better physique-wise and performance to make a concerted effort to build muscle this winter before I start a fat loss diet. 5'4", female, 140 pounds. Um, better physique-wise, really just ask uh, for performance, yes. Almost certainly, it would be better if you build some muscle. Specifically, if your performance in um, lifting is being uh, talked about, high intensity interval training go your way. Rowing may not change much uh, performance if you gain weight, but may improve. And then debating if it would be better physique wise is really a value judgment on your part. Depends on how right. you want to see your physique. You know, it's kind of funny because oh, you. Muscular. You could, uh, you could devil's advocate that perspective. Uh, uh, Mike already said it's a value thing. So that's, I agree with that totally. You, but you could also say like, it might actually be better physique wise to do the cut first because then you'll have the uh, less muscle loss to, to contend with potentially, mm-hmm. right? So at this point, mm-hmm. it might just be better to get really lean and then try and gain more muscle later rather than trying to gain the muscle now and then, you know, risk uh, or uh, not risk. Well, I guess so, but that you have more muscle to manage, essentially. I'm really splitting hairs here. This is like the splittingest of hairs, but you could look at it from both perspectives and you could say like, oh, if I just do the weight loss now, it's going to be easy. I don't really have to worry about losing a ton of muscle and then I can do a really productive mass phase, but it's really just kind of how you want to look and where you want to be in the short and long term. That's really what it comes down to. Yeah. Um, And then she says, also looking forward to the RP Summit. Yay. That's coming up sooner than later. And, uh, Folks, if you're interested about going to the RP Summit, it's in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, uh, the city of brotherly love. And um, you, it's on November the, we get a calendar, calendar pop-up, do your pop-up thing, November 9th in a week and a half. And there's going to be already hundreds of people signed up and space is limited. But if you act now, you can, I don't even know what the fuck it costs. So go on the RP Not website now. and uh, com. Or go to RB Strength on Instagram and go through there, and you can come to the summit. Meet all of us filthy RP animals in real life. Myself and James will be talking, uh, you know, incessantly about something. Um, James, do you want to do a, a dual talk at some point? We've never done one of those, a group talk. Like a, like a choreographed, like, talk? Like, that's right, Mike. We can talk about blah, blah, blah. And you're like, yes, James, I agree, blah, blah, blah. Like, just yeah, totally like, like, cheesy. Uh, like show hosts. Or we could finish our own sentences. And that's the way it goes.
people are like, this sucked. I learned nothing. You guys just delayed your speech for hours on end trying to get the lines right. Dude, that would be horrible. It will be horrible. But it will be fun. Uh, you can see, check it out on the, like, the seminars page on the website. Usually have a good time. And if any of you RP Plus people show up and you don't say hi, we're going to come after you if we find out you were there. That is the worst offense. Yeah, if you're an RP Plus, you better say what's up because you get, you get fan points. Yeah. All right. Well, actually, I was, I was pretty, pretty pleased with those YouTube questions. I always cringe because you know how, mm-hmm. how it goes sometimes. But those were really good. We had great RP Plus questions this week. Guys, I apologize. We were a little off schedule. I feel like the last several weeks we've had some scheduling issues, and they've all been my fault. So I'm feeling a little self-conscious about it. But I appreciate your guys' patience and flexibility and um, letting us do it on Wednesday and not disrupting your weekly schedule too much. So uh, catastrophe aside, I'm planning on doing the normal Tuesday next week. Mike, are you going to be around? Yes, I will be in Detroit, Michigan. Um, Ooh, so fast. I will find some Wi-Fi and get a webinar. Okay, cool. So uh, tentatively on schedule for next week. Guys, thanks for tuning in. We appreciate you very much and keep posting those good questions. Peace.